What up, Periscope? And what up, Facebook? Now I'm live. Prophet David Taylor here for your weekly live prophetic word. And uh, I believe it's a powerful word. And uh, I'm excited about it. So let's say a word of prayer and we will jump right in. Father, in the name of Jesus, we thank you for your mighty word. We thank you for the blood of Jesus. We thank you for the name of Jesus. We thank you for the Holy One, the only one that justifies us and makes us righteous in your eyes, oh God. So we thank you for the justification, the salvation that's found only in Christ. So breathe through me, God, speak through me, fill me with the Holy Ghost. I surrender my mind, my heart, my mouth, my eyes, my tongue, my lips, my hands, every part of me, I surrender to you, oh God. I must decrease, so you must increase. So breathe through me, oh God, and let what is said be what you want said to the glory of your name, to the extending of your kingdom, to the edification of the saints and to the challenge of the unbelievers so that they might turn from their ways and turn to you. And I thank you for it and I believe you for it in Jesus name, amen. All right, let me just throw off my way looking gloves right quick. All right, today's prophetic word, and I'm gonna put it on the screen, oh, here's my sister. Hey sis, let me say hi to my sister. Today's prophetic word, is possess. Today's prophetic word is possess. And I'm gonna put that up on the screen. When I say I'm putting stuff on the screen, I'm talking about my Facebook Live. Uh, when you watch the YouTube replay, it'll be up on the YouTube video, okay? Today's prophetic word is possess. It's possess. Well, what does that mean? Well, let's read our scriptures and uh, we'll get into it. And let the Holy Ghost show us what he has to show us. Our first scripture that we're going to read is Deuteronomy chapter one, verses seven and eight. Deuteronomy chapter one, verses seven and eight. So let me actually put that on the screen too. So in case you wanna look that up. Deuteronomy one, seven and eight. Okay. Now, <clears throat> just to give you a little bit of background, if you don't know anything about the book of Deuteronomy, the first five books of the Bible for our purposes, because there's some scholarly disagreement about some of the books, about Deuteronomy, about a whole bunch of stuff, but I won't get into that right now. For our purposes here today and for our study purposes, the first five books of the Bible were written by Moses. Okay, and Moses was the Old Testament apostle. Moses was the Old Testament prophet. Moses had a face-to-face -face relationship with God. Moses was the deliverer, and he was called by God to deliver the children of Israel from Egypt, from bondage, take them through the wilderness, and lead them into the promised land, which was gonna make them land owners and no longer slaves. Moses wrote the first five books of the Bible, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy, okay? Moses wrote the first five books of the Bible. The Hebrew people call that the Torah. Us uh, New Testament Christians, we call that the Pentateuch, okay? But we're talking about the first five books of the Bible written by Moses. The book of Deuteronomy is the fifth book, and it's kind of the send-off. It's kind of the end of Moses' time because Moses spends the entire book recounting the history of Israel about how God delivered them and all the things they've been through to get to that point. And then Moses encourages them to, to listen to the Lord and go forward and take the promised land. And then Moses passes his mantle after he gives his blessing, he passes his mantle onto Joshua. And then Moses dies right at the end of the book. Okay, that word Deuteronomy literally means second law in Greek. It means second law. In Hebrew, they call it devarim. Let me check that word again. I believe I'm saying that right. Uh, devarim, right? And it means the words of Moses. So it's kind of Moses' swan song, if you will. It's kind of Moses' recapping the last 40 years of his life because Moses got into his purpose and did what God had called him to do starting at the age of 80. Now that's significant. I'll explain to you why that's significant later. But just to give you some background on the book of Deuteronomy, because it's always good to understand who the writer is of a book in the Bible and what the circumstances were, okay? 
So I'm going to read now Deuteronomy chapter 1, verses 7 and 8. And I'm going to read, uh, let me see, I'm going to read 7 and 8 out of the Berean Study Bible, and then I'm going to read 8 through a, a couple other uh, translations. Deuteronomy chapter 1, verses 7 and 8. Uh, verse seven says, resume your journey and go to the hill country of the Amorites. Go to all the neighboring peoples in the Arabah, in the hill country, in the foothills, in the Negev, and along the seacoast to the land of the Canaanites and to Lebanon, as far as the great river Euphrates. Verse eight, see, I have placed the land before you. Enter and possess the land that the Lord swore he would give to your fathers, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and to their descendants after them. Uh, verse eight in the NIV, see I have given you this land, go in and take possession of the land. The Lord swore he would give to your fathers, to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and to their descendants after them. New Living Translation. Look, I'm giving all this land to you. Go in and occupy it, for it is the land the Lord swore to give to your ancestors, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and to all their descendants. Okay, now I know what you might be asking, and uh, <clears throat> what you might be asking is, what does that have to do with me now? Because I'm living right now in 2020, and this happened centuries ago. Okay, this happened thousands of years ago. What does that have to do with me? That's a good question. Here's the answer what God does in the scriptures uh, with the children of Israel is their relationship with God was not just for them. It's an example, it's a type, it's a shadow, it's a symbol. God had what they went through with him recorded so that we could study it, we could read it, we could know, we can see what they did right, and we can see what they did wrong, and we can see how God responded. So those books are in the Bible and the experience of the Hebrews is in the Bible so that we as New Testament believers or anybody that believed on God after that point could have a record of what happened in their experience so we could learn from it. So we could see their mistakes, so we could learn to avoid that, don't do that. And so that we could see their successes, so we can see that when they did stuff right, do that. Just to, to oversimplify it and to put it in a nutshell, that's how why that stuff is relevant to us now. So you can't listen to these people who tell you that the Bible isn't relevant, that it's old, that it's archaic, that it's out of Israel. None of that is true. But the things in the Bible are there so that people that are alive now can study them and learn from them and build your relationship with God based on the stuff that you're reading in Scripture. That's why we have the completed canon of Scripture. Okay? So what that means is that what God says to them we need to understand what he's saying and we need to look at their response. We need to look at when their response was what it should have been. And we need to look at when their response was the absolutely the wrong thing to do and all the shades of gray in between. Okay, because we have free will, we have free choice. So today reading out of the book of Deuteronomy, Moses is talking to them in his, his final set of addresses to the nation of Israel before he dies and tells them to move forward. So what I just read for you, Deuteronomy chapter one, verses seven and eight. Verse seven says, resume your journey. Now, why is that important? I'll tell you why. Because some people looking at me right now, I know I've experienced it. And I know some people looking at me right now and some people that are listening to the podcast and watch, watching the replay. And by the way, welcome to everybody that's on the podcast or watching the replay. Sorry, I didn't say welcome before, welcome. And those of you that are watching me live, please like and share this, because whenever a prophetic word goes forth, we want as many people as possible to hear it. So please like and share this video. If you're on Facebook Live, Periscope, invite people, and then uh, also on YouTube, okay? So verse seven says, resume your journey. So many believers, myself included, and some of you looking at me now, you have not taken a straight line with God. And what I mean by that is when the Lord first called you and the Lord was trying to deal with you and the Lord was trying to pull you into purpose and the Lord was trying to show you the life he had for you, you did not obey God and you did not obey God to the fullest. And maybe you had some areas you obeyed God in and some areas you were disobedient in. 
And maybe you had a time and a period in your life where you went astray, you backslid or you rebelled or you went after other things, or you just told God, no, God called you to do something and you absolutely did not want to do what God has called you to do. These things that now some people go straight through, like Jesus obviously went straight through. Jesus was in the wilderness for 40 days and then he got out and he never had to go back again because God has never meant for us to spend a lot of time in a wilderness situation. Because when you're in the wilderness, wilderness too long, you will get wilderness fatigue. The wilderness will wear you out. What is wilderness living? Where you're not sure whether or not you have a job, where you don't have enough money, where you don't have enough food, where you don't have a stable relationship. You're just dating people, or you just getting married, or you're just sleeping around, or you're just being promiscuous. Or if you're living celibate, you're lonely because you're trying to live holy, but you're lonely and you're tired of being lonely. All that is wilderness living. Um, uh, in Egypt, which represents slavery, Egypt, the world, Babylon, Egypt, that's all the same thing in the Bible. Egypt represents never enough. Because when you're in bondage to anything, when you're listening to the devil, and when you're listening to the flesh, and when you're listening to demons, no matter what you have, it ain't gonna never be enough. That's Egypt. The wilderness is just enough. God fed them with enough manna every day just for the day. And they were told, don't gather uh, for tomorrow. You got to trust God for tomorrow. And if they gathered too much, the overflow would rot. So they literally had to wait to be fed every day. And they got water out of the rock. And God sent a wind and he blew quail. He blew quail birds so they could have meat so they could eat that. But it was just enough for every day. So Egypt is never enough. The wilderness is just enough. But the promised land, Canaan, the land they're supposed to possess means more than enough. Now, this is a reflection of the life of believers to this day. If you are still listening to your flesh, if you're still listening to the devil, if you're still listening to demons, if you are still listening to worldly people, if you're a believer, but you're still living by worldly principles, then you are in the land of bondage and never enough. It ain't never enough. No matter what you do, you just keep coming up short all the time. If you're in the wilderness in your Christian life, then things are, you know, you have some things, but it's just enough or maybe barely enough. But promised land living is where you have more than enough. You have more than enough for you and yours and enough also to sow into those less fortunate than you and enough seed to produce fruit and crops and harvest and wisdom to plan for your future and so many things. That's promised land living. A lot of Christians just never make it. They just never get there. A lot of Christians spend their whole lives either still in bondage, which means you need deliverance. You need demonic deliverance. There's demons operating in your life and you need that broke off of you and you need to learn how to stop listening to the devil and start listening to the Lord. Or they live and die in the wilderness where they have just, just enough or barely enough where you never found the right person to marry, or you never settled in anything, or you never found your purpose, or you just keep moving from place to place. Uh, you never settle down, never find a church, never find a ministry, never find anything that, that has to do with your purpose and your destiny, and you stay on track. Okay, but promised land living is where you have abundance, where you have more than enough. More than enough, everything, happiness, joy, love, food, money, space, cars, houses, financial security, relationships, whatever. So you can see that some Christians make it to the promised land in their lives and some Christians do not. But many of us do not take a linear path. I will repeat, God never meant for you to spend no 40 years, no long time in the wilderness. The wilderness is supposed to be a quick period they actually were only supposed to be in the wilderness for two weeks, 14 days. Can you believe that? And they so resisted God and they so, murmur, they so murmured and complained against God and they so fought God until they ended up wandering in the wilderness 40 years till they died. <sighs> That's entirely possible. Don't let that happen to you. Remember I told you that what happened to them is there for an example. Don't allow that to happen to you. Don't be so rebellious and inconsistent and unbelieving towards God that you won't move forward. You won't obey 
Because if you do that, if you do what they did, you're going to get what they got. And you're going to end up going through the same things with the same people in the same situation over and over and over again until you die. That's wilderness living where you haven't moved forward, okay? But promised land li living is abundant living. So that's the scenario and that's how it relates to us today as believers. So they did not go straight through. In other words, when God took them out of Egypt, he meant to take them through the wilderness in two weeks and then they would have been in Canaan. What they did while they were in the wilderness was they murmured, they complained. They're like, oh, why did God take us out of Egypt? Why do we ever listen to Moses? I wish we could go back to Egypt because at least we knew what we was going to eat and waiting on this manna every day is getting on my nerves. And oh, Moses don't know what he's doing. And they just went on and on and on and on and on and got to the edge of the promised land and still didn't believe God. Now, you got to remember who these people are. These people saw the, literally the hand of God. I'm talking about God Almighty. I'm talking about the creator of the universe. They saw the 10 plagues of Egypt, frog, lice, a river turned into blood, brimstone from heaven. Uh, locusts, death of the firstborn, okay? Then they saw the exodus from Egypt where God brought uh, a minimum of 600,000 people and maybe 1.2, 1.5 million people because some of the Egyptians came out with the Hebrews. He brought that many people out. Then Pharaoh came after them and God put fire between them and Pharaoh and God led them a day by a cloud and a night by fire and then God parted the Red Sea and they walked through a sea uh, on dry land. And then God fed them. God made manna. The word manna in Hebrew, it means what's this stuff? And the Bible calls it angels food is what angels eat. So God took some of the bread of heaven, literally, and let it rain down to earth and fed them people with bread from heaven, with stuff that angels eat. And he made water come out of rocks. Water don't come out of rocks, but God made that happen. God bent over backwards to try to show these people that he wanted to be their God and he wanted them to be their people and he was gonna give them victory over whatever they faced, that he would take care of them. And they didn't believe it. And that's why that first generation fell in the wilderness. They never made it. So the point is don't let that happen to you. You may have been delayed you may have been delayed because you were hanging around people that were full of unbelief and you didn't quite learn yet to change your crowd or it might not have been your fault, it might have been your family. You might have been hooked up with some relatives that just weren't about believing God or maybe you were just rebellious. Maybe God called you and you just said, no, you just went the other way. You did like Jonah, like I ain't doing that. Or you did like Moses. Moses did not want to be who he was. So Moses ran from his call for 40 years. Moses tried to deliver the Hebrews in his own strength. He saw one of his fellow Hebrews when he was 40 years old being persecuted by an Egyptian. Moses rose up and killed the Egyptian. And then everybody saw it and everybody told it. And everybody's like, you're going to kill all the Egyptians? You're going to kill me like you killed that Egyptian yesterday? And Moses was like, oh, Lord, I've been found out. And Moses left Egypt and Moses went to the backside of the desert and set up a whole nother life. He got married. He had a couple of kids and he became a shepherd. Moses set up a whole nother life from 40 to 80. And then God met him at the age of 80 in the burning bush. And God stuck his finger in Moses' face and said, you're the deliverer. And you know you're the deliverer. Go down there, go back to Egypt and stick your finger in Pharaoh's face and tell him to let my people go. Moses ran from who he was for 40 years. 40 years. Because Moses didn't want to be who he was. Sometimes we go through that. Okay. But whatever your reason, the prophetic word to you today is to resume your journey. Now, that's the best news out of her all day. What that means is that God has extended it. If you're listening to me, that means you have a chance to receive this word. If you was dead, you couldn't hear what I'm saying. Or you're in the spirit realm and it don't matter because you, your spirit is stepping out your body. So, But if you're listening to me, that means this prophetic word is for you that you can resume your journey, that whatever the problem was from between when God first called you to now, if you didn't take a straight path, you can get back on your path right now. You can resume your church, your journey. That's Deuteronomy 1 and 7. Okay. That's why the Bible 
is relevant today to everything we're going through today. But the Holy Ghost is the one that builds the bridge between what happened in scripture and how it applies to you now. That can only happen by the Holy Ghost. That's why people that aren't saved and aren't spirit filled can never get a full understanding of the scripture. That's why they say ridiculous things like the Bible isn't relevant now. Yes, it is. Is the Holy Ghost is the one that builds a bridge, not us. That's the difference. That's one of the advantages of being saved. So if you're looking at me or listening to me right now, if you're not saved, I get saved right now. I get saved and filled with the Holy Ghost so I can have every advantage that Jesus died to give me, okay? So verse seven says, resume your journey. And then God goes into detail about the specific places because he had actually mapped out the land he was going to give them, okay? So what is how is that relevant to us? It means whatever your dream is, whatever God showed you in a dream or vision, whatever purpose, God has spoken over your life. That's your map. That's your land. That's the place you're supposed to be. And see, that's different for different people, which is yet another reason why you have to have your own relationship with God. So let me say this right quick. Don't ever mistake somebody else's experience for your experience. Now, this is what I mean. We all have the same Bible, we have the same Savior, we have the same Father, we have the same Holy Ghost, we have the same blood of Jesus, we have the same name of Jesus, we have the same kingdom of heaven, but we do not all have the same purpose. So sometimes when you listen to people minister, they're talking out of their purpose and they're talking about what they experienced, but sometimes you get the wrong idea that you're supposed to do everything they did, that's incorrect. You're supposed to do whatever God tells you to do. For example, if I could sum up my purpose is my purpose is I have a, a scribe anointing. I'm a writer. I write music. I write books. I write comic books. I'm also a music producer. I'm an educator. You know, I write curriculum, but I write. So I work with words. That's my anointing. Don't ask me about no skydiving. I, <laughs> I ain't jumping out of parachutes. I ain't, jump, excuse me, I ain't jumping out of airplanes with a parachute. I don't do that. Don't ask me about marine biology. I don't swim with the whales. I don't swim with the dolphins. Nothing wrong with that. And it's definitely a needed function. I'm just saying that's not part of my purpose. That's what I mean. So things in my promised land have to do with my purpose, with the things I write, my music, my books, things like that. That's my promised land. And also I'm a prophet. So once again, I'm dealing with words. I'm dealing with the word of God in my mouth and releasing the word of God as led by the Holy Spirit. You see that? That's my purpose. OK, you've got to find your purpose. So some of the things I tell you that I do or have experienced in my life, that doesn't necessarily mean that's going to be your experience. you got to do what the Lord told you to do. You understand? That's why you have to know the scriptures. You have to know the Lord and you have to have your own prophetic. So that you. OK, that is Romans 12 and 2. It says so that you can discern so that you can work out so that you can prove. What is that good, acceptable, and perfect will of God? What that means is that the levels of the will of God and what God wants you to do in your life has to be proven out by you. You have to make your mind or you have to renew your mind by filling it with the word of God and your relationship with God so that you can figure out and understand what God is requiring of you. Some of us are the nose. Some of us are the mouth. Some of us are the hands. Some of us are the elbows, some of us are the shoulder, some of us are the eyes, some of us are the heart, some of us are the knees, some of us are the ankles, some of us are the feet. But all believers, all Christians have a spot on Jesus's body, but the feet don't do what the elbows do. The hands don't do what the nose does. The stomach doesn't do what the ears do. That's the difference. And you've got to find out what that is for you. Do you understand? Okay. So God says, resume your journey. So for whatever reason, if you did not take a straight path from bondage to the promised land and you stayed in the wilderness too long, if you're listening to me, here's your chance to get back on track. Good God Almighty. All right. That's verse seven. Here comes verse eight. See, I have placed the land before you. Why is that important? Because God, in other translations, God says, I have given you this land. I am giving you all this land. So in other words, God says, he's the one that sets the land before you. He's already set it up. God has already said yes and amen. He's already set up 
for you to go in and possess the land. And then I want to go behind the language here in the Hebrew. It says enter, which means to come, come, go in and go. So that means you got to get up and go. But then that word possess in the Hebrew, I'm reading out of Strong's Exhaustive Concordance, uh, entry number 3423 uh, for the Hebrew. That word possess in English, it means to occupy, to seize, to rob, to inherit, to expel, to impoverish, and to ruin. Wow, see, that's why, <laughs> that's why you have to get behind the English and study the original languages because they're much more expressive and there's much more meaning in the Hebrew and the Greek and the Aramaic. So when God tells you to possess the land, he said, occupy it. He said, seize it, take it. But he also says, rob, what does that mean? It means that the wealth of the sinner is later for the just. It means that unbelievers don't have a right to your stuff. They think they do, but they don't. Anybody listening to the devil, anybody following Satan has no right to your stuff. And you got a right to take it back. That also includes your family, by the way. If your family is not walking with Christ and you have gotten yourself together with the Lord and you are moving in obedience, then you have a right to claim your family for the kingdom of God and tell the devil he can't have your parents, your husband, your wife, your, your children, your siblings, okay? Take it back, okay? Because the devil has no right and people that follow the devil, unbelievers, have no right to your stuff, okay? And then it says to inherit, to expel. So you know what an inheritance is? It means something that is left to you in a will, in a covenant, but it also says to expel. What does it mean to expel? That means you've got to kick out everything out that land that's not like God, which is exactly what God told the children of Israel. He told them that they got, had to get rid of those false idols. I'm going to read that in a minute. They had to get rid of everything that the unbelievers that lived on that land were doing was not right in the eyes of God. And they had to get rid of all their practices, okay, all their idol worship. Uh, some of the people that, that God displaced, they were serving a God called Moloch, M-O-L-E-C-H. They would make statues of Moloch with him like this, if you can see me, with his hands out. They would superheat the statue till it's scalding hot and then put a live baby in the hands of Moloch and that baby would be burned to death. And they would offer up the children as a live sacrificial offering to the false god of Moloch. They would do stuff like that. That's why God kicked them out, doing stuff like that. And so it says to expel, then it says to impoverish. What does that mean to impoverish? That means that uh, you're supposed to take the, the riches and the wealth, okay? They ain't supposed to be well off and rich and you struggling. You're supposed to take the riches and the wealth, okay? Because poverty is not our inheritance as believers. So if we find ourselves there as believers, that just means we haven't been listening to the Lord. Okay, if we find ourselves impoverished as believers and we have not been listening, we have not been managing our money or our talent, or we haven't been walking through the doors that God has told us to walk through, we have not been obedient. But all that's over, it's time to resume your journey. And then it says to ruin, what does that mean? Does that mean you're supposed to, uh, it's supposed to be so torn down from the past that there is no trace that the unbelievers were there in their day. In our day, what that means in a practical sense is that God wants to so redeem your life from your past until there is no trace of the person you used to be. What that means, again, to get even more practical is that everything that the devil tried to do to you, every scar, every temptation, every trial, every bad relationship you ever had, everything that came into your hearing that wasn't true or wasn't from God, God wants to wipe all of that out of your life. God wants to leave that old you, that old temple, that old life in ruins. That old life is gone and dead and ruined so that God can bring you into this new life. And he wants that old life to be so gone until it's like the temple is torn down and ruined and there's no trace. So whatever it was you struggled with, God wants there to be no trace of that in your life now. Whatever it was that happened to you, because there's a whole lot of us that got afflicted when we were children. God wants to heal you. God wants to give you the love that you were missing. God wants to give you the wisdom and the guidance. Maybe your parents didn't raise you like they should have. 
Maybe your parents just threw you away. Maybe your parents abused you. God wants to give you the wisdom and the guidance of a father, the best father of all, the heavenly father, the father who is perfect, the father who does no evil. There's no evil in him. The father who gives wisdom and doesn't hold back. He, in other words, he wants to fill in the gaps, the missing parts of your life, and he wants to heal you in the areas where you did not receive in your childhood what you should have gotten. And he wants to so fill you with love and wisdom until there's no trace of the old you. There's no trace of the old life. People always talk about things like sex and drugs. Sometimes your old life was idolatry. Sometimes, sometimes your old life was worship and stuff, everything but God. Okay, but people are always talking about they was really living in sin. They're talking about sex or they talking about, you know, money or, or you know, liquor or drugs. Yeah, that's sinful. But sometimes you can be living in self-righteousness. Sometimes you can do like Saul of Tarsus or you do like Job in the Bible. where you're doing all this religious stuff and you have no idea who God really is. Saul of Tarsus thought he was doing what he was supposed to be doing until he met Jesus. And Jesus knocked him down off his high horse. And then eventually he became Paul the apostle and Paul realized that all that stuff I thought was important, that was nothing, okay? Job realized that all that stuff I thought I was doing is no defense against the devil. Job had to let go of his self-righteousness. And when Job saw God for himself, Job said, now I see that you holy and you right and I'm nothing. And Job let go of his self-righteousness and he received the righteousness that only comes from God. So stop thinking when I'm talking about sin of the own life, I'm just talking about sex, drugs, and liquor. It can be idolatry. It can be self-righteousness. It can be racism. Are we dealing with spirits of racism right now countrywide? You could have hated another culture your whole life or and or they could have hated you. Okay, I stopped by to tell you that's not from God because we're all made in God's image. God's second commandment is we're supposed to love our neighbor as ourselves, not shoot them up in the streets like we're doing now. OK, some people have so much hatred in their hearts, they hate anybody don't look like them. But if you are a Christian, that is not your portion in this life. You do not have to spend your whole life with hatred and fear and resentment and murder in your heart because of a different culture or a different skin color or somebody from another part of the world. That's not how we're supposed to live as believers. That's not your portion in this life. So when I say your old life, stop thinking I just mean sex, drugs and liquor. OK, yes, that, but also self-righteousness, also racism, also idolatry and sometimes religious abuse. Many of us had a lot of bad experiences in church. Many of us have to recover. There is such a thing as religious abuse. If you didn't know that there are plenty of people that have been abused by religion, abused in the name of God, stuff that was not of God, not from God. It's not what God wanted. It's not what God ordained. But somebody in church or your religious background did it to you in God's name, and they were just trying to control you, or they were trying to just do a whole bunch of stuff to you, trying to possess your life, and they did a whole bunch of stuff to you in the name of God. You gotta heal from that. That's called religious abuse. That's not of God. You gotta heal from that. That's why some people swear off church and say, I ain't never going back to church, okay? Well, you need to get to know the Lord. Once you get to know Jesus and his love, you will feel his love. You will see his love for you is personal, and he will begin to heal you and help you understand that everything that them wicked people did to you was them wicked people that wasn't God, because God is not man. You see that? That's what it means that God wants to come into your life, into your very soul, to your very heart, and tear down everything that is of the world, is of the devil, is of the flesh, but also everything that is the old you. That's supposed to be torn down and put in ruins, okay? And God said, we got to go in, we got to possess all the words I told you possess means the land that the Lord swore he would give to your fathers, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and to their descendants after them. That's talking to the Hebrews. What does that have to do with us as Christians? Well, we have the blessing of Abraham upon us through faith. So that's talking to us as New Testament believers. But what that means for you and your family is that for whatever purpose God has ordained for your family, you're supposed to walk in it. Like if you come from a family of athletes, and everybody in your family has been called to play football and God called you to play football, play football. If you come from a family of politicians and your lot in life is to be elected into office and govern the laws of the land, then be a politician. If you come from a family of teachers and God has called you to be an educator, 
But God will call you to do all the things for him in the power of the Holy Ghost so you can open your mouth and give testimony to him. But whatever it is that is in your family, your bloodline, that's there for a reason. Like what's in my family, uh, music, education, uh, artisans, people that work with their hands, a lot of carpenters, uh, plumbers, things like that in my family. Uh, but most of us are teachers or musically inclined. Most of the tailors, my father's family. So that's what I mean when I say there are things in your bloodline that God has also put in you. That's why he allowed you to be born into that family or adopted into that family. And you can get the spirit on that family. If you're not related by blood, you can get an anointed mantle transfer. Yes, you can, because there are things that God has promised 10 generations back, things that God has promised to people that have lived that you never knew that you're supposed to be living out and carrying your leg of the race in your lifetime. And then you pass your baton to your children and grandchildren and so on. That's the way it works. And that's why if you don't know any of what I just said, why the Lord has to heal you, because I stopped by to tell you, some people feel like they're worthless. Some people feel like they don't have any purpose. Some people feel like because of the things they've done, that they're beyond redemption. There is nothing beyond the blood of Jesus. Now, not the hand of man. I ain't talking about people. I'm talking about the blood of Jesus. There is nothing that the blood of Jesus cannot cleanse. The only thing that stops it is unbelief where you say, I don't want it. I don't believe that because God's not going to force it on you. But I stop by to tell you that you do have worth. You do have value. You do have purpose. But if you don't feel that you do, that's a sign that you need God to heal you because the creator put you in your mother's womb for a reason. He used the seed of your father, the egg of your mother, the womb of your mother to form you. But your parents do not make you. Your father didn't make you. He sired you, but he didn't make you. Your mother didn't make you. She carried you, but she didn't make you. Ask a pregnant woman, what color are your child's eyes? She don't know. Ask an expectant father where his wife is expecting. How tall will your child be when they're 10? They don't know because your parents don't make you. Your father sired you. He released his seed into your mom and your mother carries you, but God makes you. And that's why if you're searching for purpose, for meaning, for what am I supposed to do with my life? You have to go to God. You have to go to Father God through the Lord Jesus Christ in the power of the Holy Spirit. That's the only place you can actually find the reason you were born. And nowhere else you can go. And every day that you spend chasing after anything other than Jesus is a wasted day. Because you're not going to find what you're looking for apart from the Lord. It's not going to happen. Okay? All right, let me move on to this next verse, and then I'll be done, okay? Because remember, today's prophetic word is possess, okay? We're supposed to move forward and take the land. So our next scripture, let me put this on the screen, and then we'll be done, is Numbers 33 and 53. Numbers 33, 53. I'm putting that on the screen. Okay. Okay. Now, the book of Numbers is right before the book of Deuteronomy. Numbers is the fourth book, Genesis, Exodus, Le Leviticus, and Numbers, okay? The word Numbers gets its title from there are two census, censuses taken of the children of Israel. That's where the title of the book comes from because it was numbering them to see how many uh, strong the nation was, okay? And they had just gotten the law of God from Mount Sinai. And uh, Moses had come down, if you've seen the movie, The Ten Commandments, where Moses come down, comes down from the mountain with the commandments written on tablets of stone, okay? The book of Numbers picks up after, right after that, okay? So let's read, I will read uh, to you Numbers. I'm going to read actually uh, verses 52 and 53 like I did before. So actually, let me put that up so I do it right because I want you to get the right scripture. It's actually Numbers 52 and 53. Okay. All right, here we go. Reading out of the Berean Study Bible, Numbers 33, 52. You must drive out all the inhabitants of the land before you, destroy all their carved images and cast idols, 
and demolish all their high places. And that ties right into what I just read in Deuteronomy 1 and 7, okay? That's God spelling out in detail what I just said, okay? Out of uh, what the scripture said in Deuteronomy 1 and 7. That's, that's God spelling out in detail where he says, you got to drive out all the inhabitants of the land before you. You got to destroy all their carved images and cast idols and demolish all their high places. Everything that they worship that wasn't me says, God, you got to get rid of all that. You got to drive them out. You got to destroy, you got to tear all that down. And that's why that's some of the, me and my son were just talking about this the other day. That is some of the, the tougher processes about being a Christian. Being a believer means at some point, Father God is going to come in and he's going to want to tear down everything that you have put in place of him. That can sometimes be a rough process because sometimes you have idols that you don't even know about. Sometimes you have some things that you are worshiping and sometimes you have some things that you are believing and sometimes you have some things that you are bowing down to that is not what God said. That's not him nor a part of his word. And if that's the case, it's a false God. It's an idol. Okay. At some point in your Christian walk, Father God is going to want to come in your life and deal with that. And sometimes that process is rough. Sometimes you've been carrying it for so long. I'll give you an example. Some people worship their parents. Your mama said something to you when you was 10 years old and it got stuck in your head. And now all the years of your life, you keep saying what your mama said. Well, mama said this, or maybe your mama cussed you out, or mama said this, or mama did that, or mama did that. And now every time what's playing in your mind is what your mother said, and that's what's been governing your life. That's an idol. Your mother is your mother, not your God. Your mother carried you and your mother gave birth to you, but your mother is not your God. But if you have been living your life uh, according to what she called you, instead of what the word of God calls you, then you made an idol out of your mother, okay? A lot of people make an idol out of marriage. Mm -hmm. And they're wrong with being married. Marriage is a beautiful thing, okay? But some people feel like they don't have any worth unless they're in a marriage relationship. And I'm saying to myself, what Bible are you reading? There are plenty of single people in the Bible. Elijah, Elisha, Daniel, uh, John Baptist, John the Baptist, Jesus, Apostle Paul. You trying to tell me all the people were failures because they didn't have a spouse? Incorrect. Okay. But a whole lot of people, they worship marriage and they worship the idea of being married. And some people, as we know, they worship weddings. <laughs> you won't be a wife. You won't be a bride because <laughs> that ain't the same thing. <laughs> some people, they worship that. Okay. Ain't nothing wrong with being married. Ain't nothing wrong with getting married. Ain't nothing wrong with weddings. But when you make a God out of it, when you think that your worth is tied into whether or not you have a spouse, and if you think you don't have anything to offer the world as a single person, that is not true. Apostle Paul stayed single by choice and wrote the vast majority of the New Testament. When Apostle John uh, was on the island of Patmos at the end of his life, he was out there by himself. He was 90 years of age minimum. Apostle John was at least 90, and Jesus gave him the book of Revelation. Not John and his wife, Apostle John by himself on the island of Patmos. So, so if you got this idea in your head that you don't have any value outside of a romantic relationship or a marital relationship, that is a false idol. So at some point, you might have been carrying that belief your whole life. At some point, Father God's going to come in your life and he going to work on tearing the idols down. So the thing to do is not to fight him. I know you might want to fight him. I know you might want to resist him. But if God tells you that you need to get rid of your pride, you might go through some very rough things to learn humility. But the thing to do is learn that humility. You'll get through it faster. You won't have to spend years wandering in the wilderness if you just learn what God wants you to learn. And your wilderness journey can then be very quick and you can get to the promised land very, very quickly. Oh, but if you get rebellious and oh, if you start telling God what you're not going to do and oh, if you if you resist, you do that, then it's going to take you longer. And that's why some believers never come into the fullness of what God had for them to do in this life, because Father God is going to come into your life at some point. Jesus says so. 
and he's going to come as a husbandman, as the gardener, because Jesus is the vine, we are the branches. So we are rooted in Jesus. He's the source of all life. Well, Father God is going to come and prune those branches, not because he's trying to punish us, not because he doesn't love us, but because if there is dead weight in your life, he's trying to cut out that dead weight so you can bear more fruit. Don't fight the process. It's not going to be pleasant many times. Sometimes it's going to be extreme. Okay, but don't fight it. Learn how to hear his voice and obey, even when it hurts, even when it doesn't look like what you thought, even when it's not what you wanted. You'll get through it faster. Okay, but one way or another, the Bible says in Numbers 33 52, you got to drive out all the inhabitants of the land before you, you got to destroy all their carved images and their idols and demolish all their high places. The Bible is very specific. It's all got to go. Okay, then verse 53, you are to take possession of the land, take possession of the land, to occupy, to seize, to rob, to inherit, to expel, to impoverish, to ruin, same word as before, of the land. But here's a new word I want to look at. It says, and settle in it, for I've given you the land to possess. Okay, it says, and settle in it. That phrase, and settle, coming out of the Hebrew, uh, I'm looking at Strong's number 3427. You can read it for yourself. I give you references so you know I'm not making it up. It means to sit down, to dwell, to remain, to settle, and to marry. That's right. That's why you have to get behind the original language so you can understand the breadth of what God is saying. So when it says in English, you are to take possession of the land and settle in it, that's what it says in English. In Hebrew, it, sit down, dwell, live there. You're not going to wander anymore, okay? It says to remain, okay? You're not going to be moving from place to place. You can remain. You can put down roots. Then it says to settle, okay? So in other words, everything in your life is not always up in the air. Now, again, just to make it personal, I have had whirlwind experiences where it looked like it's just one whirlwind to the next. <laughs> okay, but God says he wants to bring you to a place where you're settled because no tree can put down roots unless it's settled. If you notice everything in nature carves out of space, okay, even parasites, because they're trying to latch on to something else, but everything in nature has a space that it's got to be in to function. That's no different for us as people. And then it says to marry. What that means is that those of you that have been praying to God about a spouse, some of y'all have been waiting a long time. Those of you that have been praying to God about a spouse, God said, it's time for that spouse to come in your life. So you can settle down, get married, have that marital relationship and build your family. Wow, what a promise, okay? So the prophetic word for today is possess. God is telling us he's ready and we are ready. One more time. God is telling us that he's ready and we're ready. And like I said earlier in the broadcast, don't let it throw you if you didn't take a linear path. Maybe you didn't go straight through. Maybe you didn't obey God like you should. But if you are alive and you are looking at me now or you are hearing my voice, you've got another chance. You've got another chance. You've got another chance to enter in finally, to enter in and inherit, inhabit, settle, dwell, and marry, to have a stable life, to have a solid life, to have a life you can be proud of. Maybe you're not proud of your past life. Father God said, I want to wipe out all traces of that, okay? Because as Christians, shame is not our portion. Fear is not our portion. Poverty is not our portion in this life, if you didn't know that. You ain't supposed to be shamed your whole life if you're a Christian. OK, you are supposed to live in fear your whole life if you're a Christian. You are supposed to live in poverty your whole life if you're a Christian. Did you know that? That's not our portion in this life. Our portion is in this life is what the scripture is saying. OK, so the spirit of God is letting us know it's time to possess. OK, here's a prophetic word. I got to release it. For behold, my people, I have brought you out to bring you in. Never believe that all you have been through has been wasted or for no reason, but rather I have prepared you to take the land. I've 
prepared you to possess it and to dwell in it and to move forward and to be landowners and to occupy and to live your dream. I want you to imagine abundance, abundance of fruit, grapes and, and oranges and bananas and wheat and, and, and grain and corn and more than enough. That's the life I'm calling you to now. If you haven't made it before now, I'm calling it to you now. A life of more than enough, an abundant harvest. That's what I'm giving you. So go forward and do not be afraid and do not let anybody talk you out of it, but rather go forth and possess for I have commanded you so, says the spirit of the living God. Amen and amen. See now that word bless my heart. Okay, see that blesses my heart right there. That blesses my heart. So that's what we're supposed to do. That's why you have to have the prophetic in your life. That's why you have to have your own prophetic flow. That's why you have to have a regular steady diet of the word of God. So you can understand what is God saying to me? And what is God saying to me now? So that you're not living in the past, but that you're living in whatever God is telling you to do right now. So I'm excited. I'm going to obey. I'm going forward. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm doing everything I know how to do to make that happen. Okay. All right. God bless you. Now, let me go in the spirit and ask the Holy Ghost if there's anything else he wants me to release. Okay. The Holy Ghost is telling me uh, somebody out there, you're struggling with back pain. Okay. Reach out your hand. You see, I'm reaching out my hand. Reach out your hand. Just reach towards me. In the name of Jesus, I release healing for your back. In the name of Jesus, let the pain in your back be loosed and let the healing power of God flow into your back right now. In Jesus' name, amen. I command your back to be every whit whole. In Jesus' name, I command it, declare, decree, and it is so right now. Amen and amen. All right. All right. Amen. All right. So don't forget to uh, check out my website, prophetdavidtaylor.org. Uh, you know, I don't do what I do for money. I do what I do because God has called me to do it. But if you want to best bless my ministry financially, uh, you can give that to my cash app. My cash app is a dollar sign, DMT2. Uh, two. It's not the number two, it's two capital I's. Uh, so I'm going to put that on all the links. So if you want to uh, bless me financially, I uh, really uh, appreciate that. What I'm doing with that is uh, now I just released my latest hymn. If you don't know about my 150 hymn project, uh, and I did some ministry on music. Uh, so go check that out on uh, my Facebook Live page that you're on right now. But also my 150 hymn uh, page that's also on Facebook because I'm writing a new hymn for every song. I have my prophetic devotional out. This is the last month for the third quarter. Then the fourth quarter, October, November, December. Uh, uh, and then you get uh, special news and stuff on my newsletter. You get alerts. And if there's discounts or things like that, so sign up for my newsletter. It's a little button that says sign up right on my Facebook Live page. Okay, because I'm doing a lot. And then there's a lot more music to come, a lot more prophetic stuff. And then remember, at the end of the year, I do something called a prophetic locator word. So at the end of 2020, on December 31st, 2020, I will ask the Lord to give us our grades. What does the Lord have to say as the year closes? Then you know, on January 1st, 2021, I again ask the Lord, what is your word for this year? Now, those located words are on my YouTube channel. So you can look at what the Holy Ghost said on December 31st, 2019. And you can look at what the Holy Ghost said December, excuse me, January 1st, 2020. Those are called prophetic locator words. So I do those at the end of the beginning of each year. So those are on my YouTube channel, Prophet David Taylor, okay? I have a lot more stuff coming. Stuff I haven't told you about yet. Stuff I'm excited, but I haven't told you about it yet, but I got a lot more stuff coming. So anyways, when you sow into my ministry, it's going to feed all of that, okay? All right, amen, and God bless. Thank you so much. Thank you to those of you that watch me live, Periscope, Facebook. Thank you, thank you to those of you that are listening to the podcast. Thank you to those of you that are watching the YouTube video. Remember to please like and share this broadcast because we want it to be a blessing to as many people as possible. And uh, we want the word of God to bless wherever it goes, okay? All right, amen and God bless. I will see you. Now, this Thursday coming up is No More Genies. I have a teaching series I do on Thursday nights called No More Genies. And it's talking about 
getting rid of our genie concept of God and embracing the, what the scripture actually says. So we can get rid of all these wrong ideas we have about God, thinking that he's some kind of genie, where we just have to rub the lamp and get into what the Bible actually tells us to do. That's no more genies. That's this Thursday night at 7 uh, p.m., okay, right here on Facebook Live. This Thursday night at 7 p.m. right here on Facebook Live. So those of you that are on my alert list, you'll get an alert reminder, okay? All right, amen and God bless. Have a great week. Remember, it's time to go in and possess your promised land. To threaten, and sickness is his weapon to fill my days with strife and cut me off.